Today we are getting back into our series in Romans in a new, uh, with a new mini-series called Spiritual Worship. Now we're getting really close to the, the one-year mark. <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is the one-year mark from when we started the series in Romans. <laughs> Can you believe that? It's almost, I think we're right at about 11 months It's been a a one year, and we're all the way to chapter 12. And we're just blazing through this, just blazing through. Uh, If you've missed any of these messages, you can go to flfc.church, and you can click on messages. And if you scroll down just a little bit, you'll find a playlist. You can see all the messages in this Roman series in order, and you can go back and re-listen to some of those or catch up if if you'd missed some of them. Um, But so today we're going to talk about, quote, spiritual worship. Now, it's not just any worship, but spiritual worship. Come on, how many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of you have been there where you felt like you were just reaching right into the throne room of God? I mean, come on, how many of you know there's worship and then there's worship, right? I mean, just nod at me if you know what I'm talking about. There's worship and then there's Worship, where you're, you know, the tears are flowing and, and you just, you know, your hair's blowing back from the wind of the Holy Spirit because you just, you have entered into the throne room of God. There's the, well, at least I'm here, worship. You know, it's, it's one of the reasons we turn out the lights so the praise team doesn't have to see those that are looking at their clocks, sipping their lattes. <laughs> That we want them focused on Jesus. But, you know, if we could see out in the audience during the worship, a lot of people are like, you know. But then there's other people. Man, they are just all in to get everything that Jesus has for them. Now, let me say, how many of you would like to reach into heaven more often when you worship? How many of you would like that? I think we'd all like that, right? Because we've all felt that. There's that time like, it's like, this is amazing. And then there's those times like, man, I think the worship team's just a little off today. We always blame the worship team, like it's their fault if we're not experiencing a move of God. It, it must be the singer's fault. You know, it's the song. It's saying, yeah, come on, how many of us have a favorite song or favorite songs? We just love it when we sing those songs. You know, I do too. Everybody does. But if the song choice is the limit, it's the lid on how well you worship, Man, you, you need to, to rethink the, your lid, right? Because it shouldn't matter which song we're singing. What matters is who we're singing to. Can I get a good amen right there? So we would love it. All of us would love it if we could just worship God, a spiritual worship more often. God wants us to worship him. And not just that, well, I'm here kind of worship, but with a spiritual worship. Look at, for, look at John chapter 4, verse 23. It says, but the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is looking for spiritual worshipers. Do you see that? You see, you like it. You know, for those that said, there's probably people in the room, they've never experienced what I'm talking about, where it just feels like you felt like there was that barrier and you reached right through it. And your hand is right in heaven and you're just experiencing the presence of God. Sad to say, there's probably people in the room today that have never experienced that. But a lot of us have experienced that. God wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth. All right? So we're really going to pick up the pace here now in Romans chapter 12. We are going to, we're going to really going to start blazing through this. So we're starting in Romans chapter 12 and we're going to get all the way through verse 1 today. We're going to get all the way through verse 1. Uh, and before we jump into chapter 12, verse 1, I want you to remember the context. It's so important to remember the context when we're reading Scripture. And it's easy for us to see the chapter lines as a barrier. You know, we think that this, and I mean, listen, 
For those of you that are a little bit familiar with Romans, you're excited because you're like, oh yeah, this is great. Romans chapter 12, some of my favorite passages. But don't forget that that line there, chapter 12, wasn't really a line there. Paul was writing right through this. So let's pick up Romans chapter 11, verse 36 to get some context. For from him and through him and to him are a few things. For from him and through him and to him are all things. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. All things are for him. Don't forget this. We are, what we are about to read is connected to what we just read. It's not separate from what we just read. It's connected to what we just read, that all things are from him, through him, and to him. Okay, are you ready? So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, and it says this, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now remember that that Romans chapter 12 is a pretty big shift. We're we're kind of turning the corner here. Paul is going from a lot of the somewhat technical information. If you've been with me in the Stumble series and some of these last uh, several messages, I I mean, I've even been criticized by people. All this stuff is too deep, Pastor Jeremy. You're you're leaving people behind. I'm like, listen, I'm I'm just trying to help you understand the Bible, and that's what the Bible teaches. And I admit, that last section, a lot of Romans that we've been through, is a bit technical and a bit deep. But Paul had a purpose to get through it, and he was getting to a point. So he's gone through a lot of this technical information. In a lot of ways, all of that information was pointing right here. Chapters 1 through 11 were a setup, an introduction to get to this point. Another way of looking at it is that chapters 1 through 11 were a lot of the why, and now we're getting to the what. Now, if you've missed the last 11 months of <laughs> messages on this, let me give you a brief recap. I, I'm gonna, I, I don't want to make it sound like you can skip all those. They're like, oh good, now I don't need to go back and listen to those. You should go back and listen to them. But here's, here's a very crude, a very brief synopsis of chapters 1 through 11. It's, it's, it's that it's not your bloodline. It's not how good you are, but you are saved by grace, and it's all because of Jesus. Did you hear me? It's not because of your bloodline. Now, that may not mean much to you, but to the audience he was talking to, the Jews of that era, they believed that because they were of the Jewish nation, well, they were saved. Paul's like, no, nope, it didn't work that way. It's not because of your bloodline. It's not because of how good you are. It's not in your super awesomeness at, at keeping the law or being a good person. It's not the good things you do. It's not even the... It's not the bad things you don't do, right? Are you with me? It's not how good you are. It's you are saved by grace, and it's all because of Jesus. If you got it, say you got it. All right, so then he says, then he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the ESV. I love it. That's my, my current go-to translation. But I didn't grow up with the ESV. I grew up with the New King James. You know, I was, kind of grew up in an area where people thought the King James was the holy one and the New King James was just its, you know, close cousin. The, you know, for those of you who weren't strong enough for the King James, well, you could... The New King James was tolerable. But I grew up, so for me, when I think about Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I still think it in the New King James. Listen to what it says. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 
Now, you might be thinking that seems quite a bit different than the verse we just read. It's actually not very different at all. Uh, In the ESV, he says, I appeal to you. In the New King James, he says, I beseech you. Let me ask a quick question. When's the last time you used beseech in a normal sentence? I beseech thee to bring me some coffee. Anybody? Anybody beseeching anybody? No. In the, in the New Living Translation, it says, I plead with you. So the word being translated, that is the word parakaleo. We're just going to assume I said that right. And it means to implore or exhort. In other words, what, we're, what he's really saying there is, I beg. I'm begging you. Think about that for a minute. I implore you. Or, if, you know, your classical version, I beseech you. I beseech thee. And there you add the thee, man. You sound super spiritual. <laughs> but what he's really saying is, I beg. I beg you. I'm begging you. I mean, and, and I like to kind of imagine the posture, you know. Paul's like, I'm begging you. Have you ever been so desperate? You're like, you're just begging you. Maybe some of you parents, like, son, I'm begging you. Don't be an idiot. I'm begging you, please, don't do anything stupid. Come on, is there a parent in the room that you, maybe he didn't say that exact word, but you were thinking it. Yeah, you know you were. The honest parents have their hands up. The the honest parents who don't have their hands up, they've got stupid kids and they don't even know it. But there's these moments where we're like, I'm begging you. I'll do whatever it takes for you to hear me right now. I'm begging you. Now, if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, this kind of seems out of character, right? Because he's not a beggar. I mean, if, if you know your Bibles, Paul is not known for being soft, for being genteel. You know, he, he's not, Paul doesn't talk the way I do. He doesn't get up and say, I encourage you guys. You guys are amazing. I love you guys. You know what? If you just give God a little bit, God's going to give you a lot more. I mean, I'm always trying to encourage you. Paul's like, listen, suck it up, buttercup. You need to get over you and start doing things for Jesus. That's the way, I mean, am I right? Those of you who know your Bible, didn't, didn't Paul? Paul's pretty aggressive. Paul was not known for begging right? So it seems a little out of character for Paul to be begging. Look, he says stuff like this. Look at Romans chapter 1 verse 6. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. But now he's saying in chapter 12 verse 1, he's saying, I'm beg you. I'm begging you. I appeal to you. I beseech you. I am pleading with you. Such, I want you to take note of that because a person who does not normally beg is saying, listen, this thing that this very next thing I'm going to say is so crucial that I'm pleading with you to hear it. Now the next part of this is the same in both translations. It says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. Now, a quick question for you. Do you know what a sacrifice is? Just maybe low hand, you know what sacrifice is. You think you got that one? I don't need to... Okay. I think the word conjures up weird images, like for me, maybe, you know, the maiden going into the volcano as a, as a virgin sacrifice. Does anybody else get that one? Is that just me? Am I the weirdo here? Uh, maybe you're, you know, for those of you who are more biblical, maybe you're thinking about, you know, Abraham getting ready to sacrifice Isaiah. Maybe you're thinking about sacrifice of lambs and bulls. Okay, how many of you got some kind of sacrificial image going through your mind right now? Sure, a lot of us do. Uh, Maybe the sacrifice, how many of you know that our, our, our chef extraordinaire, James, was up all night long cooking 75 pounds of barbecue for all of us? Come on, talk about sacrifice, yeah. 
So let's get a little closer to home here. When was the last time you made a sacrifice? Oh, this is going to be good. I mean, because a moment ago you were thinking about, you know, virgins being cast into volcanoes, at least I was, or, or, you know, children being put to death on the altar, an animal losing its life. But now when I put it in your context, you were like, well, I got up early that one time. You know, such a sacrifice, or I'm here, I'm at church, God, you're welcome. I showed up. This is my sacrifice. It's, it's amazing that when we bring the sacrifice close to home, how the standard of a sacrifice changes dramatically, right? We were talking about all the other hemisphere of this thing. We, when I said, do you know what a sacrifice is? Nobody said getting up early, right? Nobody said church attendance then. But now that it was talking about my sacrifice, whoa, the bar fell a long way. And some of you are like, well, Pastor Jeremy, I'm under the new covenant. Jesus paid the price, therefore I don't have to make sacrifice. Well, it's true, in a sense, your sacrifice can't win your atonement. You can't pay for your sin. I get that. That's absolutely true. But here we just read in Romans chapter 12, sacrifice is actually expected of us. And if we're going to fulfill that, we ought to know what sacrifice is. You see, we have a pretty distorted view about what a sacrifice is. But all throughout history, most people have understood that when you sacrifice something, that thing is gone. Right? Whatever it is, if you sacrificed it, if it was a goat, no more goat. Are you following me? If you've sacrificed a bull, maybe a pair of doves, they were gone. We're getting those back. They were gone. And in our modern culture, when it comes to sacrifice, we tend to only sacrifice the things that we have more of. Think about it. When we make sacrifices, most of us today, we're only sacrificing the things that we have plenty of. If you were asked a lot of modern Christians about what they're sacrificing, they'd get really holy. Talk about Hebrews chapter 13 verse 15. It says we bring the sacrifice of praise. Did you hear me? Sacrifice of praise. I know I said it weird. Oh, glory to God. What a holy, noble sacrifice. You just sacrificed your praise. But guess what? You still got some left, don't you? There's more in that bucket. You pulled that praise out. There's still plenty there. You may, the scripture talks about bringing a sacrifice of praise, but is it not really the kind of sacrifice we're talking about? Maybe other Christians think, well, I do sacrifice. I give not only offerings. Hold on. This is a really spiritual person. They give tithes. Tithes. This is a hard word to say. Super spiritual. I mean, a spiritual person gives in the offering, but a super spiritual person gives tithes. You know what a tithe is? A tithe just is 10%. So that super spiritual person is giving 10% of their income to their local church. But how do most people give to their church? I'm talking about most people. I'm not talking about you people. You people are amazing. I'm talking about the people at the other churches in town, right? How do most people give when it comes to giving financially to their church? They give if, are you hearing me? If I have enough or if I have some left over, then I will give. Some people view even showing up at church as a sacrifice of their time to God. But here in Romans, God is not asking for your time. He's not asking for your money or your praise. He's, what is he asking for? He's asking for you. He wants you. He wants your body. Okay, that sounded, that made God sound creepy, but... uh, (laughs) He wants is your physical reality, right? He wants you. He wants all 
of you. God wants you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now remember, if something is sacrificed, what is it? That's right, you're very good, it's gone. And if a sacrifice means that something is gone, that means when we give our lives to Jesus, we do so with no strings attached. Not I give my life if, if you'll make me famous, if you'll give me a great ministry, I'll give you my life if you do something for me in return. I'll give you my life if you make me rich. It's amazing how many ifs people are capable of coming up with. It's just, I give you my life, and that's it, and that's all. When it comes to Jesus, we just give him our lives. That's what we do. That's what we're supposed to do. And it's so sad to see that in our culture today, so many people come to the church, come to a, a religious experience looking for God to give them something, to add something to their already pretty good life. They never experience the real power of God, the real freedom, the real ministry, because that only happens when we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, where we say, here I am, use me. Here I am, send me. This is so good. Keep reading, because it's about to change somebody's life today. Just hit your neighbor. Tell them, God is speaking to you today. God is speaking to you. It says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Look at this next line. Holy and acceptable to God. Did you see it? Holy and acceptable to God. Wait, what? <laughs> Do you mean that there are some sacrifices God does not accept? Think about that. See, if, we, if we're presenting an offering to the Lord, we can kind of get our head around the idea that God would be pleased with this offering or maybe not so much that offering. But when it comes to presenting ourselves as an offering, are you telling me, preacher, that I can give myself to God? And he's like, no thanks. You know, let me tell you something. Somebody needs to hear this today. That's exactly what I'm telling you. It's, we are to present ourselves a living sacrifice, not just any old sacrifice, not just what you have left over after you burned yourself out, used yourself up, but a living sacrifice that is holy and acceptable to God. I'm not really surprised. I didn't get a big amen there. <laughs> Do you know in Genesis, there's a, a story about how God accepts Abel's sacrifice, but he rejects Cain's. Did you know that? Do you know why Cain killed his brother? Because he was Abel. <laughs> Sorry. It's totally wasted. <laughs> Look at what God said to Cain. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. If you do well, if, everybody say if. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. We are to present our bodies as a living, everybody say living, living sacrifice, holy. Do you know what holy means? It just means set apart. See, we have this idea that it means perfection and we, we give it a class that we can't attain to. Because you can't attain perfection as we would consider the word. It just means set apart. We present ourselves to God set apart. Come on, I, some of you don't know this yet, but this is so good. This is life change. This is liberating for some people today. 
God wants our lives, not our deaths. See, we have this idea that it'd be noble to die for Jesus. What he really wants is for you to live for him. Well, did you hear me today? Dying for Jesus is just a moment and it's over. Some of us, you and I, maybe me, I don't know, we may end up giving our lives, paying the ultimate price in the name of our Savior. I think that'd be an incredible way to go. I don't know about you, but I think that'd be kind of awesome. But that's not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about giving our living, giving our the alive portion of our lives. In other words, God does not want your death. Do you hear me today? God wants your life. He wants your living. Notice it says living sacrifice. God does not want you to die for him. He wants you to live for him. So let me ask you a question. What does that look like? Because I, I promise you, I promise you, it's so, so good. There are so many people that hear this verse and they amen right along. Like, oh yeah, glory. That's a good preacher. Going to be a living sacrifice. But we have this subjective measure about what that means. You ever notice we give ourselves a lot of A's for effort? Am I the only one to notice that? It's like we all get participation trophies. It's not just the kids' soccer anymore. It's like, well, I like Jesus, therefore I'm a living sacrifice. <laughs> is, is this too real? Do I need to soften this up? But if, if, for those of you <laughs> who would like to understand what an actual living sacrifice would look like, Fortunately, we have plenty of Scripture to oblige that request. It's not just liking Jesus. It's not just warm, fuzzy thoughts about your pastor, because you all love your pastor. I know you do. It's not just being part of a church body or a church community. It's not sticking around after church for a barbecue, because, well, that was a lot of sacrifice. There's more to it than that. Now, I'm going to read you a little bit of a longer passage. Would that be okay? Hopefully, I won't bore you with the reading of Scripture today. But we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 4. If if you've got a Bible, you can open up your Bible there. We'll put it on the screen for you as well. And if you don't know this, you can go to flfc.church and click on Message Notes, and the Scriptures are all there for you as well. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to start in verse 22. And it says, put off your old self. Now, I'm going to try to resist the urge of adding commentary with every line because it'll take forever. So I'll go ahead and start that now. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Sounds good so far, right? Wave your hand at me if that sounds good. We're all on track. Okay, so therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. That means don't lie. Speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Listen to this next line. Be angry and do not sin. How many people did something stupid and their response was, well, I was angry. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Yeah, we've all done it. So those of you who do not raise your hand, you're making me angry. Just kidding. So being angry is not an excuse for bad behavior. Do you see it? It says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. 
And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Listen to this. Some of you may need to underline this next part. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. (laughs) Along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Now remember what I told you a few minutes ago. The end of a chapter doesn't mean the end of a thought. So let's keep right on going. Chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Listen to this. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. Did you hear what I just read? It's not saying it just shouldn't happen badly. It's saying it shouldn't even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetousness, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them, for at one time you were in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, For the fruit of light is found, listen to this, in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord and take no part of unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. So what is this great and living I mean, think about it. If we fulfilled everything we just read there, oh boy, we, we would feel like we are right up there with Moses and Elijah. <laughs> and what is this great and living sacrifice that we give to God? It is your spiritual worship. Do you see it? That's what spiritual worship is. Spiritual worship isn't your favorite song. Spiritual worship isn't that moment where you're crying at the altar during your favorite worship set. Spiritual worship is where we leave this place and we are a living sacrifice unto God. We are never more spiritual than in the moments we're outside of this place living for Jesus. That's what our spiritual worship is. And I love how the New King James just calls it our reasonable service. I love that. It's like my favorite. That thing that we think so great and phenomenal and we're so holy and spiritual. Paul just says that's, that's just reasonable. The word reasonable there, it's, it's essentially a word that means pure. It's genuine and pure. And what's more pure than spiritual? It's spiritual worship. The word worship there is a word that's translated can mean service, act of service or servitude. That's how you get the New King James will say reasonable service, but ESV says spiritual worship, pure worship, pure service. It's just what we do. 
I mean, just a few weeks ago, we had a night of worship. That's what we called it. And a lot of you came out here, man. We just had an incredible time just worshiping Jesus. What if, what if we had a day of worship where we all just cleaned the toilets? I'm, I'm just going to guess the turnout's going to be a little bit lower. What if we have a day of worship where we just work in the house of God? What if we have a day of worship like we did our Love Our Neighbor day? Wasn't that a great day? What if we, in those moments when we're mowing those lawns and we're picking up trash and we're talking to those neighbors, we realize that in that moment we're more spiritual, we're, we're more engaged in worship than many of the moments we're here during the songs. That's what our spiritual worship is. Let's read it one more time. Verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. What does your spiritual worship look like today? Today.